Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Dagish America Presents. I am your host, Ben Harl, and as always, I'm so glad you joined us. Last episode, we talked about some of the history of fumigation with Jim Smiley. If you haven't had an opportunity to listen to it yet, feel free to go back and do so. Jim shared a ton of really good information with us on how the industry ended up where it is today. So last week, we discussed where our fumigants originated. Today, we're going to discuss why we fumigate in the first place. Did you know that according to the Australian Department of Agriculture and Food, it's estimated that we lose one quarter to one half of the world's grain crops during storage? And according to the University of Wisconsin USDA, in the United States alone, stored product pests can damage, contaminate, or consume as much as 10% of the total food produced? This is a significant loss in food supplies and revenue associated with stored product pest infestation, as well as a potential for product recalls and possible damage to a company's reputation. With all that being said, understanding how to identify stored product pests, what to look for during an inspection, and just how to decide what actions you should take to both prevent and or control these pests is absolutely critical. Today, we've invited Bob Warren, owner of IPM Solutions, to join us to discuss everything stored product pest. Bob has almost 30 years in the industry working for some of the major players, and he spent most of his career working in the fumigation sector, which directly relates to stored product pests. I've known Bob for several years, and he is definitely what I would consider to be an industry expert on this subject. So please help me welcome Bob to the podcast. Hey, how you doing today, Bob? Good. And yourself, Ben? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thanks a lot for uh, agreeing to come onto our podcast. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for the opportunity to share some uh, fumigation knowledge, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, that's the goal. <laughs> so, all right. So, I just want to start out just asking you uh, if you could just kind of tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your history, your background with the pest control industry. Okay. Well, I started in the industry, probably got my first taste of it right out of high school when I was working in a bakery in Orlando and worked on the sanitation crew for a little bit and uh, got to see what stored products, stored product insects, the problems that we had with those. Started college in uh, Orlando and then I ended up getting a uh, scholarship to Kansas State University for uh, bakery science and management which was related to the food industry, obviously, because it dealt with uh, large-scale bakeries, milling, uh, flour mills, and such. Uh, Started in the industry in the bakery side. I was a quality control manager for a large mix company for almost two years, Um, and then was sort of recruited by a pest control company to work for them on the West Coast to sort of open up operations out there because my background in the food industry lended itself to um, understanding the the food side of the business could go into flour mills or bakeries and see what the operations were and know where to sort of look for the problems with stored product insects went to the to the west coast worked west coast for 12 years uh, opening up some offices out there uh, was the regional manager and then um, just sort of stayed in the industry after that, changed companies and uh, went more to the East Coast and dealt uh, on that side with more hospitality and uh, restaurant issues, but then got back into the full fumigation side a few years back, was the uh, fumigation manager for North America for one of the largest commercial pest control companies in the U.S. And then decided to semi-retire, retired for a little bit, and then started my own company, IPM Solutions, which I do just a little bit of work on the West Coast, some on the East Coast, and uh, just trying to stay in the industry. I just love it. It's a good uh, good industry, good, good group of people, and uh, always fun to be around and uh, discuss the industry with people. So still hanging in and uh, <laughs> yeah. loving every minute of it. 
Sure. So IPM Solutions, I know you guys do fumigation, but you also offer a lot of consultation services, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. I uh, actually uh, have done some training for annual training for rail car fumigation training for a customer. I've done that in the past. And also I speak at one of the manufacturer's annual continuing education training sessions from time to time as a speaker, but just completed, really exciting, just completed some work on the East Coast doing some flower cars, rail cars with CO2, organic flour using CO2. Had great success. I believe it was a first. I don't think it's ever been done. Yeah, yeah. And I believe the Degish America, our company, was actually uh, involved with that particular fumigation as well, which was great. It was great to be able to share that partnership with IPM Solutions. And and I do believe you're correct. I do think that that was the very first, at least to my knowledge as well, the very first CO2 fumigation of a rail car in the United States. So we're definitely working in some areas where even if it's been done, it's not been done much, which is pretty exciting. Correct me if I'm wrong, but CO2 is considered an or, or organic fumigant. So this opens up a lot of possibilities for facilities that want to maintain their organic status and still get some control of stored product pests. Is that is that a correct statement? Correct. And it was Dag- Dagish is who I partnered with. Dagish I've uh, had a long history with from previous employers, but I uh, have been honored to speak at Dagish's. That's who I was talking about earlier, Dagish's uh, annual training uh, sessions. I've, I've spoken there a couple of times. H- have a great partnership with Dagish. Uh, we teamed up to take care of this customer on the East Coast. And um, it's going to open the doors up for some other opportunities. And again, CO2, I have previously done work on the West Coast back in the uh, early 90s with CO2 on uh, wheat wheat tanks and containers of uh, finished product. Yeah, well, we'll definitely have to uh, talk about having you back on the podcast at some point to go more in depth on, on the CO2 fumigations because, I mean, I know it's been around for a while, but finding new and innovative ways to use existing products, I mean, you know, our industry's uh, full of that. And that's one of the things I like the most about it is the, the level of innovation that we have to maintain in order to be successful. I mean, these regulatory requirements uh, they, they're they certainly not getting any less for us in the industry. So it's really nice to be able to use some of these existing products in ways that are innovative, safer, easier to use, maybe. I don't know. Just uh, just used in, in a different way to achieve the same level of, of success. It's pretty exciting. Uh, yeah, it, there, there's definitely some opportunities there with CO2 that gives our customers, especially the organic customers, an, an option where before they didn't have a lot of options. But it, it's an emerging market, I think, that's going to uh, definitely open up some opportunities. Well, that's some exciting stuff. Uh, and it relates directly to our topic of conversation today, which is stored product pests, because that's what we're trying to control with CO2 in an organic environment or stored product pests. So. Um, I'll just go ahead and dive in and ask you, and I know you've had, you have a lot of experience with stored product pests, identification, you know, escalation procedures, all that. So, but I want to start with the basics uh, for any uh, folks that are on, that are listening to this, that just, they're just starting out. They don't really understand fumigation that much. So just right out of the gate, if you could just give us your definition of what a stored product pest is. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, I would say it, it is a broad definition, but uh, usually stored product pests I would classify as insects that are usually found around or infesting cereal or nut-based food products. The food items could be anything from raw wheat, corn, oats, rice, barley, sorghum, um, to processed foods such as, you know, flour, as we were talking about, malt, cereal, spices, pasta, nuts, seeds, crackers, cookies, dog food, Etc. You know, even candies. You know, we just had Halloween, and you know, there's there's uh, always pops up an issue sometimes with candies, especially that have chocolate in them. So stored product pests are usually found in those items, and sometimes people will call them pantry pests if they're in the home. They'll be you know in the pantry. They'll be around boxes of cereal, rice, pasta, crackers, um, or like I said, even the dog food. So. That's sort of a broad definition, but that's, I think, is a good one to start with. Sure. Yeah. And and I would agree with everything that you just said on that. Now, I mean, obviously, that's very broad. So we're talking about a massive uh, variety of pests that we face in the fumigation industry. And the good news is, is when we fumigate, it pretty much takes care of all species of pests. But 
fumigation is not always the ideal option. And so I wanted to talk about why it's important to identify what these pests are. And in order to do that, I mean, there's several different things that we use to do that. But the first thing is just kind of identifying what the top stored product pests are that we face. I mean, it, well, in the United States, I shouldn't say because every every geography is a little bit different. But what would you say are the top three stored product pests that we face on a regular basis in the United States? Well, the, the top three, I would say, and, I, and the first two I would classify together, that would be red and confused flower beetle. There, there is some differences in there in them, but you know they're pretty much the same. The second one would be cigarette beetle. Tied to that would be possibly the drugstore beetle. And then Indian meal moth, and probably the next one uh, to maybe go to the third to the fourth one or so would be maybe warehouse beetle. Those are the typical ones that I have seen the majority of over the years. But there's a whole nother gamut of them. There's, there's rice weevils, granary weevils, flat grain beetle, and even sosids. You know, some people call them book lice. Those are probably your top insects that we deal with on a regular basis. Right. And I, and again, I, I kind of made a blanket statement earlier when I, you know, fumigation will control all of those insects, but it, it's very important to identify the insects because all of these insects take a vastly different amount of fumigant to control uh, because of their hardiness, so to speak. So, I mean, I, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, but I, why do you think it's important for us to identify these stored product pests? I'm sure you would agree with me, but are, are there any other things that you could think of that would make uh, it important? Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, you, in a lot of states, you need to make sure that the your target pest is present before you can do the fumigation. Um, right. Label is the law, and then some states have a little bit more constricting regulations. But you definitely want to identify the pest because... You want to make sure that the fumigant you're using or a fogging agent is going to take care of that problem. You want to make sure that you know that you have a successful IPM program, integrated pest management, you know, to identify all the pests that may invade your, your facility or be brought in. Each pest may have different means of entry into the facility, and you got to identify the pest to determine the next step in the process to eliminate or control the pest so it doesn't uh, negatively impact your operation and product quality. The first thing is, you know, I would say in this whole process is definitely identify the pest because you need to identify that pest and then determine the next step. Sure. So what kind of tools do you use to help you identify these different species of stored product pests inside these facilities? Well, a, a lot of it is going in and inspecting the facility, becoming a detective for lack of better terms, going in and looking in the nooks and crannies. You take flashlight, scraper, a mirror, or you can you know, use a mirror to get into hard to reach areas. You need to definitely go into those areas, take a look and see what the practices are there. A lot of times you can see evidence of insect activity by insect trails, maybe in spilled product or dust on the floor. And obviously, if you've got a facility that's not maintaining a good perimeter line for inspection or good sanitation practices, you're probably going to have more opportunities for stored product pests to be present. But you need to make sure that you're going into those facilities looking for you know, the potential of where, they, where they're where they at, are they being brought in, are they coming in from outside? And, you know, part of that inspection process is talk to the people that are there. The people that are out in the warehouse, for example, the day-to-day -day, uh, forklift drivers, the, uh, the loaders, the stackers and everything, they're there 24-7. And they're a good source of knowledge for you or the inspector that comes in to find out, hey, where are you seeing this? Where are you experiencing a problem? And a lot of times they'll be very, very helpful in saying, hey, you know, we don't have a problem until such and such sends us a load of product. And then maybe that's the key right there. Maybe the, the location that is sending you the product may be sending a problem. You could have a problem inside the transportation vehicle that had nothing to do with, let's say that the, uh, the producer of the product uh, used a common carrier to, to deliver their product. Well, that common carrier may have been carrying another product in their trailer that had a problem and um, they didn't address it. They got spillage or insects in the trailer. They put clean product in and then you're, you're bringing a problem into, potentially bringing a problem into your location. 
So again, being a good detective and really digging down into a, a lot of issues such as, you know, the transportation, um, inspection. Inspection is key, you know, a, a long answer, but I would say inspection is definitely key in trying to find out where your problems are. Well, actually, I'm glad that you uh, made that a long answer, actually, because it really emphasizes how important it is to ask the questions and to really put that detective hat on when you're trying to identify the different species of stored product pests and when you're trying to identify where the problem is at. If it's localized, you may be able to treat it in a much less invasive fashion uh, find alternative methods other than fumigation or at least entire facility fumigations. And, you know, it also depends on what level of control the uh, the customer wants as well. So putting that detective hat on, in my opinion, gives you a lot more options to choose from than just coming in and saying, hey, it doesn't matter where it's at. Let's just do a general fumigation and it's going to solve your problems. In today's IPM or integrated pest management world, you swinging the biggest hammer isn't always the best option. So I definitely think that detective hat helps. So I'm definitely glad that you answered that in the way that you did, because I think it's important for people to realize that. Yeah, because you, you could have, you could go into a, a you know, a, a, a 3 million cubic foot warehouse and only have a problem in maybe one pallet or possibly even one bag of product. And they could remove, if you could identify that and isolate it, you could remove that product, do inspection and find that maybe a spot treatment uh, with a good residual can take care of the problem or a space fogging, a small space fogging will eliminate the problem versus a full shutdown of a facility for fumigation. I think that being an ethical and a straightforward company, you need to make sure that you're giving that customer all the best options. It might not be what they want to hear. They might want to not do anything, but you might say, hey, this, just let's get rid of the product and then you don't have to worry about it. Or you might just be able to, to do it, like I said, a small space fogging. I, I, and my, my mode of operation from day one that I've got in is definitely give the customer the full facts and your recommendations. And again, don't base those on uh, uh, revenue. Right. Based on, on solving the problem for the customer and you're going to get repeat business. Absolutely. And that's the important thing is the repeat business. Now, you did mention uh, pheromone monitoring, which is a tool that is widely used in the pest control industry for stored product pests. So I want to ask you just if you could give us kind of a brief rundown on what stored product pest pheromone monitoring is and why it is so important and integral to the control of stored product pests. Well, the, the pheromones have been around for you know many years. They've been around since I started. Having a, a good pheromone program will help you identify potential areas that have activity. They, they should be used as a monitoring tool. They're not the you know the only thing that you need to be doing. Um, I had a customer, I'll give you an example. I had a couple customers on the West Coast, but this was back in the 90s. Uh, one customer used to put pheromones for Indian meal moth out around the perimeter of his building. And his thoughts were, hey, if I put these pheromones out along the fence line, I'm going to stop any Indian meal moths was the, was the insect he was going for. I'm going to stop any, any Indian meal moths from getting in my facility. And we had the discussion. I said, well, I said, you are possibly stopping some getting in there, but you're also drawing, uh, potentially drawing the insects to your facility by putting them there. And I said, you're, you're not doing anything about what's inside your facility. So I said, I, I would definitely recommend that you, you know, stop putting pheromones outside. We know that there's insects outside. They're naturally occurring um, in some areas. They eventually did stop that. And then I had one customer that uh, their program was to put uh, pheromones into incoming truckloads. And they're, uh, because they had gotten trouble with, again, it was Indian meal moth. Uh, and had to fumigate their facility. So they said, well, we're going to put, our program is going to be put a, a pheromone into incoming loads, leave it in there for two hours. If we find any activity, we're going to reject the load. My recommendation was, I said, you know, hey, that's, that's great. That's going to tell you if you've got any adult males in there, but you're not going to know if you have eggs or larvae or active 
adults, male or female, in the product that can't get out in that two hours to find the pheromone trap. So right. I said, it's giving you a salt, uh, a false sense of security. So I think you're better off doing a visual inspection of the incoming materials and, you know, go that route. Uh, because again, pheromones, they're not the, the magic bullet. They're part of the, the process. They work fantastic, but it's, there's no one particular item that you can use in your toolbox that's going to say, okay, if I do this one thing, I'm never going to have a problem. You have to use a uh, variety of tools and, and pheromones are definitely uh, one of the tools you want in your toolbox. Yeah, I've always felt that stored product pest pheromone monitoring devices were, I, I used them obviously to identify pests, to identify circumstances and situations, but I know it's become more prevalent, especially since the Food Safety Modernization Act, to use those to set threshold levels to dictate what kind of escalation procedures that you need to do for treatment of potential stored product pest infestations. So, so I'm, I'm kind of segueing into that. Can you explain to us kind of what I mean by threshold levels and escalation procedures? Well, yeah, the, every facility is going to have their own criteria for what is acceptable and not acceptable. For example, if you're in a, a drug facility that's manufacturing aspirin, let's say, you know, they don't want to have one fly in that processing area because it's a sterile environment, it needs to be a sterile environment. So every company has their own threshold and they determine and say, okay, if we find this many insects, we the next step is to do a space fogging or break the area down and inspect it thoroughly. If we find so many insects in a product that we, they might throw that product away. They might have to reprocess it, sift it out. So it's once the pest has been identified, they've got to determine their next step to eliminate or control the issue. They might change suppliers if raw materials is the culprit, maybe start better rotation practices for their products or supplies. They might say, hey, we need to institute a better cleaning practice in this area of the plant because we're having increased activity. They might want to adjust their fogging or fumigation or treatment schedule of the facility if they have one. If they don't have one, they might say, okay, well, we need to determine if we need to do a treatment of that type. Maybe it's a one-time treatment. Maybe it's, we need to get on a schedule and do it. And if, are there any physical changes to the facility that need to be made? Maybe they've got some screens on some doors that were, were damaged or they're, they've got negative pressure. They're basically pulling in insects from the outside. I had a uh, customer in the uh, central part of the U.S., that uh, was a manufacturer of uh, uh, like saran wrap, okay? And it, that wasn't the customer, but that, I'm talking about the type of product. It was a, it was right. a machined, machined roll that they could not have any insects, obviously, in that film. And we identified that they had a, a problem with their airflow. They were basically, it, because of the, their operation, they were pulling air in from the outside. So all of their doors, we needed to check for weather stripping. We talked to them about putting filters on their um, air filtration system to eliminate the insects coming in because it was gnats and small flies that were being sucked in. So we worked with them on that as well as putting up insect lights to try to get as many of the insects that once they got into the building, catch them before they were able to get onto the product. So again, physical changes to the facility may need to be made. And again, it comes back to that inspection part of it and determining, okay, what's the problem? Changes in techniques should be based probably on the following, like the type and number of pests identified. You know, they need to set their pre preset their thresholds. They also need to make sure that they're thinking about maintaining their product integrity and safety that goes along with employee safety, be environmentally friendly. Are we going to fog, fumigate, spot treat, or destroy the product? What's our effectiveness of controlling the pests? And you know, and, the, and you know, I hate to say this, but the bottom line is, it's it's got to be cost effective uh, and and be able to protect your product quality integrity all at the same time. If they're going to have to spend a hundred thousand dollars to take care of a problem that's only affecting. 
ten thousand dollars of revenue, maybe they say, you know what, we we need to change our process altogether and maybe not run this product because it makes no sense to do this. Right, and so, I'm glad you mentioned the the cost effectiveness too because I, I I wanted to. Uh, include that. I, I can't tell you how many times I've actually been out to facilities and assisted them in setting up, initially setting up threshold levels and escalation procedures. And you always start out by asking them, well, what is your threshold level? What is your ideal threshold level for stored product pests? And when I say that, I mean, how many can we capture in the pheromone monitoring devices before we deem that some type of an escalation action is necessary and more often than not, the answer I get is, well, it's we have a zero tolerance for stored product pests. I mean, if we catch one, we want to take some kind of an action. And I guess there's such a thing as a completely pest-free environment. The pharmaceutical industry, or they're very sterile, and they do have a zero tolerance policy. They have to. But the cost associated with that is so prohibitive. And they can do it because they have, well, they have to. So regardless of the cost, because of the type of industry it is. But if you're a grain storage facility, the thought that you're going to be able to have absolutely zero stored product pests in your facility. I mean, yeah, you can probably set it up that way, but the cost to do that is going to be astronomical, especially if you start getting into con treatment instead of, um, instead of construction controls or climate controls. When you start getting into fumigations, I mean, you know, I mean, you're going to, in the summertime in the, in the Midwest, in the United States, at least, you're going to catch a stored product pest every time you visit a facility and look at their pheromone monitoring devices. So if you have to take some kind of an escalation action for one insect, it's going to be a constant treatment. And so I think it's important that we talk about that and what the acceptable levels are for, for stored product pests. I mean, they're, they're naturally occurring in the environment. So you're going to run into stored product pests no matter what you do. It's our job to know what that escalation point is and treat them accordingly. And like you said, it's not always the biggest hammer. Sometimes you can treat them by isolation, spot treatment. I mean, there's all kinds of different ways you can treat for them, but setting those threshold levels, I think, are critical for cost effectiveness and also for a common sense control, I guess. Would probably well, yeah. be the best way to put yeah, it. Yeah, because, you know, uh, when I was doing, most recently when I did some organic, I'm going to use the organic work as a, an example, but I, I did organic work on the West Coast, you know, years ago. We had spoken with the customer and said, okay, well, what's your, we understand that you've got activity. Okay, that's one thing. Okay, but what, because organic fumigation and treatment is expensive because um, don't want to get too far into it, but you know, CO2 is very, very hard to hold on to. It's one of the toughest gases that you, you can contain. So there's a lot of product being used and went to the customer and said, okay, well, what is your bottom line to spend on this problem? Because they had a threshold of uh, expense that they could make where it made no sense to treat it after. Because and what I'm, what I'm saying is, if it was going to cost ten thousand dollars to treat a tank full of organic wheat, their margins on that wheat was so low. They said it makes no sense for us to keep it as organic. We can switch it to regular wheat and then treat it conventionally with fumigation. Okay, right. Uh, where we're not going to spend that money. So they have to determine. That customer has to determine. Okay. When they're doing their thresholds, again, it comes back to also, is it cost effective? And, and that's where you're running into, you know, you can run into some problems. But if you're not doing your part as a pest provider and giving your customer all the options that are out there, and, and that might not be doing anything. That might say, you know what, take this product and destroy it. It's, it doesn't make any sense to treat it. Or let's eliminate it from, pull it from the warehouse and only fumigate 20 pallets versus doing the whole warehouse. But again, it comes back to that inspection part and setting up thresholds uh, with the customer. And that customer, sometimes you have to have some tough decisions or tough conversations with that customer and say, you know what, this, this isn't going to work. You're wasting your money by treating this. You know, I always told the, uh, uh, you know, customers on the West Coast, we would fumigate four times a year at production facilities and as soon as we had done the fumigation, they're opening the doors up and all outside the facility is naturally occurring red and confused flower beetles. You could walk outside and just see them crawling up the wall. 
Well, if they're not doing any type of treatment outside and trying to pest proof their building, it's a waste of time because yeah. they're back to square one. So again, that's where it comes back with the customer having those thresholds set up insect wise and monetary wise. Yeah. Yeah. And they both, it's a tightrope walk sometimes trying to talk to the customers and come up with a solution that's both feasible and economical, but also solves the problem with the store product pest. It's not always, a, it's not always an easy conversation, that's for sure, but it's definitely a necessary one. And one that helps you when you're having that conversation with your customer is to be able to have a variety of tools at hand and a variety of solutions at hand. And not all of them may be quite as efficacious or successful. I mean, fumigation, of course, is going to kill everything because that's what it does. But it's not always the most cost effective. So being able to give them more than one option and let them choose or help you decide on which option is best based on, you know, all those different factors, I think is critical, especially, you know, like we said earlier, with maintaining long-term relationships with these customers. Short-term, they may... You may overwhelm them with options and overwhelm them with different aspects of this, but long term, I think they're going to remember that you were able to offer and provide them with all these different variety of options, and that's going to help strengthen their relationship uh, for sure long term. So let's let's pretend that we're talking to a brand new fumigator, uh, somebody who's green. They, they're just starting out in the industry. Maybe they just got their fumigation license or state certification. Maybe they haven't even gotten to that level yet. But what kind of advice would you give that new fumigator that's just starting out in the industry? Go back to school and find another profession. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Um, you know, th there's several things that I, I, I would say, you know, I'll try to put them in what I think is a, the, the priority level. You know, the first thing is for them to educate themselves by thoroughly reading and understanding each fumigant label many times not just a one and done, know the product inside and out with all the safety precautions coming second nature to them, know the product, what it can and can't do, you know, know what you can and cannot fumigate with the fumigant at hand and, and, you know, don't cut corners. You know, my first, the first company that I went to work for, the, the first, unfortunately, the first week I was with them, I twisted my ankle on a job. So the first impression of my then boss was, oh, great, this guy's, he's not going to work out. He's a little on the weak side. So I was, had to stay in the office for two weeks and do, you know, stay in the office. I couldn't physically go out on jobs. But fortunately, they had, and this is dating myself, they had uh, VCR tapes, okay? Not DVDs. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> the old VHS tapes. So I sat in the office for two weeks and watched every VHS tape on safety, on fumigant product and everything. And it helped me tremendously because I learned so much by reviewing those and reviewing the labels. It was unbelievable. And, um, I, you know, I can't stress enough to educate yourself. You know, my former one of my former positions one of our former colleagues, Mr. Mr. Wilson, used to laugh at me. He he's what worked for a uh, one of the distributing companies. He used to laugh when we would talk. We would do training together, and he says, "He goes, I think you 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 read those labels cover to cover, don't you?" And I said, "You bet, yeah." I said, "I it, nobody's gonna uh, argue that I don't know the label." I definitely look at the label and make sure that if we're going to do something, it's on the label. There's some gray areas. I'll give you that. But you need to make sure that you know what that product can do legally and efficiently and safely. Probably I put safety number one. Sure. But, you know, and with that being said, I'd say the new advice would be, you know, know the capabilities of all your safety and application equipment. Don't guess. Don't ignore the technical standards that are outlined in the product manual. It's going to tell you what that piece of equipment can and can't do. This next part is a little bit tough, but I would say don't listen to people who tell you that you can do it this way. Don't worry about what the manufacturer says. Oh, that's yes. That is that's scary, huge. scary, scary. That should throw a red flag up to you because you want to make sure that, that you are following the label 
and the manufacturer's guidelines. Those manufacturers of the, the safety equipment and the product have spent you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars developing their products. They know what their equipment can and can't do. So don't fall for somebody saying, you know, well, ah, don't worry about that. We're going to do it this way. You know, the third thing I would say would be educate yourself on um, the pest issue at hand. What's needed to successfully and safely eliminate the problem. You need to know your pest and what is needed to achieve the control necessary for a successful fumigation or treatment, you know, whether it's a space fogging or fumigation. Definitely, you know, you, you need to be the, the expert in the room. A lot of this comes with time, you know, surrounding yourself with people that are, you know, knowledgeable. But, you know, also think outside the box when challenged by areas that you run into that maybe you're doing going to do a fumigation. If it's determined you need to do a fumigation, think outside of the box when you got an area that you need to seal. Figure out the best and safest way to maintain your your concentration level to achieve the desired results. You know, don't, again, don't come back to, don't always accept this is the way it's always done. This is the way we do it. You know, look, if there's a safer and more effective way to complete the job at hand, go for it. Think through it. Right. Yeah, I would agree with all that. And I will attest to your knowledge of labels. Uh, You know, I've done a lot of training with you in in my uh, employment history as well. And and I have to say, there are I don't know if there's anybody that I know in the industry that is more knowledgeable on fumigation labels than you, Bob. So I can definitely attest to that uh, with firsthand knowledge. So, yeah, and I agree with everything that you just said. I mean, reading and understanding the the labels, the product manuals, the SDSs, that's where you need to start uh, for sure. And that detective hat is so important. And I think the one thing that a lot of people need to remember, and you were alluding to this, and I'm so glad that you were, is is when you're doing uh, your inspections, when you're doing your fumigations, maintain your level of curiosity. The most important question to me when it comes to pest control is the question of why. Uh, you know, why is this cost prohibitive? Why are these insects in this particular location? Why am I finding them here and not over here? Why are my gas levels dropping? And that, that why question, it kind of, you can apply it to every aspect of, of stored product pest control. And you may or may not get the answer to that why, but I think asking that question is extremely important to the amount of success you're going to have when you're treating for stored product pests. Oh yeah. If you're not asking the whys and, and, and inspecting and doing it, you're, you're, you're not going to be successful long-term. Right. Yeah. I agree with you hundred percent. You know, the other thing continuing on, on the advice, you know, uh, I've got a a few more things that came to mind that, you know, one of the ones that's very important is inspect the facility. Again, if you're going to do a fumigation, if you've done all the other work, if you've done your inspection, you've had a conversation with your customer and, you know, okay, it's determined that, hey, we're we're going to need to fumigate. If that's that's what's going to be done, then you need to inspect that facility thoroughly in advance for any areas that are gonna be hard to seal or aerate. Look for problem areas and places that may pose a safety issue or an area that's not gonna hold the fumigant. You know, and again, part of that comes back to knowing your product. I had a customer in West Texas, it was a meat processing facility and they had a processing area that had a rodent issue and they wanted to treat that area to low dose to eliminate uh, the rodents. Well. In part of the building that was, I forgot what the distance was, but it was a huge distance. They had $3 million worth of already processed meat. And uh, I went in and I said, okay, I said, uh, we can we can fumigate for you. However, you need to remove all of the meat out of this area. And they looked at me and they said, what are you talking about? It's a thousand feet or f- I forgot. It was a ridiculous amount of distance away. There were several uh, rooms that were in between the fumigated area in this area. And I said, listen, I said, the fumigant's going to seek cold. It always happens. You know, you you find fumigant in the the refrigerators, uh, freezers, and everything along those lines. I said, the fumigant's going to seek cold. I've seen it through the years. I said, I'm not going to have a $5 million going away barbecue for the food that we, that you know, the $5 million worth of beef we would have to buy from you if the fumigant gets in there because it's not on the label. It couldn't come in contact with it because it's not a label. So they they did empty the the cooler. And uh, guess what? After the fumigation, 
guess what we found in that cooler? <laughs> Fumigant. <laughs> Fumigant had traveled all the way over there where even some members of my team said, no, this can't happen. They said, wow, we would have never thought that. And I said, yep. So you need to make sure that, you again, it comes back to knowing your product, inspecting the facility and knowing what's you know going on. And knowing the product, part of that, you know, another item is, you know, having a well-written uh, fumigation management plan. That's that, critical. Critical. That's, that's going to cover all aspects of the label, safety, effectiveness, notifications to the first responders. Use it for free planning. It, you know, and I always told my teams that I worked with, is that if it's not documented, it didn't happen. Yep. Okay. You have to have this because when you're first starting out, a couple of things. When you're first starting out in the industry, you're getting bombarded with so much information. So you need that fumigation management plan, not just because it's required by the label, but you need to have it so you remember everything. Yep. Okay. Now, as you gain knowledge and as I as I went through the industry, I had, a, a, I would say, close to a photographic memory. So I was doing work before we had fumigation management plans. But as time goes by, you can't remember everything. Age just does catch you. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, but again, you know, if somebody says, well, I don't like to use an FMP, then I would say, well, you're breaking the law because it's part of the label. Okay. If somebody tells me they don't want to use an FMP, I would be scared to death because if they're cutting that corner, what safety issues are they missing? So, you know, do your fumigation management plan, follow it, use it. Again, I come back to another item is, you know, ins- make sure that you, you've inspected the fumigated area thoroughly. Prior to fumigation, right before you release, make sure that there's no unauthorized people, livestock, pets, lock everything down, placard, inspect before you release the fumigant. You know, I heard horror stories, never happened to me, but horror stories of people going in and finding people sleeping in the warehouse right yeah. before they're ready to fumigate. You cannot take anything for granted, you know, inspect, inspect, inspect. And when you think you've inspected, inspect some more. Yeah. You know, and then and a couple more items surround yourself with not, you know, knowledgeable team members that think safety is their number one goal each day going home. I used to tell my guys, what's your number one goal today when they would come to work? I would ask them. OK. And my, my comment would be your number one goal today. You know, some of them would say, well, making sure all my route was done and making sure that I uh, I sold some extra product or did whatever. And I said, nope. Your number one goal is to make sure that you go home safely to your family. Yep. That's your number one goal. You also need to develop relationships with distributors and manufacturers. I, I use our relationship as a perfect example. I, you know, I knew you when we, well, we, we had worked at the same company, but we weren't working at the same time, but you were uh, with a distributor at the time and you know, we've developed a relationship that I know I can call you if I've got a question on something that I know, I know you well enough, you're going to give me a straightforward answer. Might not be the answer I want to hear, <laughs> you know, but uh, again, that's part of making sure that I, I, I'm surrounding myself with people that you can trust and that are very knowledgeable. They've got years of experience. They've got stories they can tell. They can tell you the stories that, you know, I, I shared a couple of them that the don't, the best stories that you get from somebody are the don't ever do this story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, the last thing I would say is you don't have to take every job. If you can't do a job safely and effectively, tell the customer the facts, you know, don't chase the money. Be honest with yourself and your customer all the time. And some sometimes walking away from a job shows the character and integrity that uh, you're made of. And uh, it goes a long way with your customers. They say, well, you know what, that guy's, he, he, he's willing to walk away from this. He doesn't want the money, but he knows it's unsafe. So he's not going to do it. And that goes, you know, a long way. Right. The money is never worth your reputation or your safety. No, or kill or, or, or someone's health yes. or life, Yes, you know. You, you can't you can't cut corners in this business. I, I always you you know you used to travel around with me when I did my training with the company I was with, and I don't know if you ever remember, remember me saying. I said you, you never see a dumb old fumigator. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know that we we either promoted them, they quit, or they killed themselves. Yeah, <laughs> you know that you know it's a long long winded answer on for you know to people coming in, but just be knowledgeable. Again, you know, surround yourself with people that love the industry and, and are going to do the right thing. 
you know, and, and, and unfortunately, I see a lot of the, and I, and I consider myself one of them, the old timers, uh, fumigators, that the knowledge is starting to leave the industry. And we need to make sure that we're sharing it. And, and this podcast is a perfect example of the new new way to reach out to people and educate them. And I thank you and Dagish for doing this. Uh, it's it's just something that we, we've needed to have for a long time, but we need to share the knowledge and make sure that people are uh, continuing the the good fight because, you know, fumigants are only getting, uh, our options are getting less and less and regulations are starting to clamp down on us. And, and that's not always bad. That's not always bad. But again, I, I applaud you and, and um, Dagish for, you know, putting on, the, you know, these sessions that helps educate the people that are, that are coming along. I really appreciate you saying that, Bob. And uh, I mean, of course, that's the goal is to try to promote education and trying to steward our industry and to help people who are new to our industry because we're, we are starting to see a wave of, of new people coming into the industry. But I mean, we're not gone yet. You're not gone yet. So <laughs> if somebody does have extra questions for you, I mean, how do they find you? How, how does somebody contact IPM Solutions for consultation or for questions or for uh, some of the services that you can provide? Well, they can always call me direct. Uh, it's area code 610-587-8693, or uh, they can email me at ipm.solutions.llc at aol.com. And yes, I'm one of the ones last people at AOL, <laughs> but I've I have no problems using them, but they, they can always, like I said, that, and I'm on LinkedIn as well. You know, LinkedIn, they, they can send message me on LinkedIn under uh, Bob Warren. It's Bob Warren, at, uh, you know, and it shows IPM solutions. So um, those are the ways they can get me or they can, uh, a lot of people, like I said, you being one of them, they contact me through Dagish as well. Sure. Yeah. Um, Okay. Well, hey, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Uh, this has been a very beneficial conversation. Uh, I really appreciate you taking some time out of your schedule to join me on the podcast. And that's it. I, I really appreciate it. Well, again, thanks for the opportunity, Ben. I appreciate it. And again, I applaud uh, you and Dagish for providing this service to, to the industry. It's, it's something that uh, I think will be well received and well overdue. No, oh, Well, thanks. I appreciate that, Bob. I want to thank Bob Warren for helping us gain a little more insight into the world of stored product pest control. I think it's beneficial to be able to pull back from our day-to-day -day functions and take a look at the big picture. It definitely helps put everything back into perspective. On the next few episodes of Dagish America Presents, we'll begin diving into the different fumigants on the market. We'll discuss the differences between them and how and when each should be used. First, we'll be speaking with Herb Yaman, president of Dagish America, about phosphine. I'm very much looking forward to this conversation as phosphine is one of the oldest and certainly most viable fumigants on the market today. In the meantime, if you have any questions about this episode's topic or any other questions relating to the industry, please make sure to reach out to us. You can find us at DagishAmerica.com or on all of the main social media outlets. You can also feel free to email us at info at dagishamerica.com. And until next time, again, I'm Ben Harrell, and I hope you have a safe and terrific day.